Thank you very much for coming. I'm really excited to be here. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about the semantic web uh, in Python. Uh, I'm uh, really excited to make this talk because actually the, the guys who are involved in this field uh, usually um, uh, that they used to, to love with Java and stuff like that because uh, a few years ago this kind of stuff uh, were made mainly in the Java language, but nowadays there are many solutions that you may use for your Python code. Uh, very few words about me. Uh, I got a PhD in computer science in the University of uh, Naples last year. Now I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Salerno. I'm so I come from Italy. Um, I love data science and all the, the, the topics related to this kind of stuff. And the other half of me is a geeky guy, so um, we may talk about uh, any of the funny uh, things we usually uh, love. Okay, um, some very briefly uh, keywords about the, the things I'm interested in. I um, usually work in, with information retrieval stuff, machine learning, and recently uh, for my postdoc with linked data and semantic web, so that, that is the topic of the, the talk today. Uh, and I usually uh, work with this kind of stuff in Python. I mainly use all these tools. So for instance, NetworkX, NumPy, SciPy a lot, Cyclelearn for my machine learning code, and uh, GenSim uh, for uh, topic modeling and audio flip for uh, semantic data. So um, actually the t this talk is mainly based on uh, RD RDF lib. want to, to, to make you a brief presentation of the main features of this great package. So uh, the talk is semantic web master linked data with Python. So the first thing I would like to talk about is the web, okay? Uh, I don't know many of you are already aware that researcher in the information retrieval or uh, web analysis um, estimated that the, the shape of the web is like a bow tie, okay? Actually, the, the web graph is composed by a core, which is the main part, which is uh, also uh, known as this uh, strongly connected component, that's the core of the web, uh, where all the pages link each other's, okay? And then there are, uh, from on the left, the origin regions that contains the, the, the pages and the resources in the web that link to the core, to pages in the core, and the termination region that contains pages that are linked to the, 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 the pages, um, linked to by the pages in the core. Uh, just to make very few uh, estimation of the size of these parts, the core contains almost the 30% of the web, uh, the outer regions contain all, the often contain almost the 25% of the whole web, and there are there is a 22% of this connected page. This is of course an estimation. Uh, for instance, uh, how can you uh, reach the origin uh, region if no page links to them? Okay, so it's just an estimation. Anyway, uh, from a knowledge management point of view. The WWW, so the World Wide Web, is full of data. And actually, the data are usually published in different formats. They may be available in PDF, in TF, in TIF, as for images, or text files. And all these pages, all these resources, can be linked to or by HTML pages, okay, or other documents in general. So these kind of resources are the data that you can link to in the web page, in the web graph, okay? But this kind of approach has some limitations. First of all, the data format is for human consumption. It's mainly supposed to be for human consumption. And the, the different formats available on the resources on the web require specialized algorithms and tools to access the resources, search for the resources, and reuse the data. So this is when and why linked data comes into play. Uh, linked data refers to a set of principles and usually best practices for publishing and connecting structured data on the web. And all the principles and uh, best, practices, best practices are got mainly guided by uh, W3C standards and recommendations. Uh, 
actually, the, link, the linked data model is basically um, founded on, on the basis of the WWW resource model. Uh, every resource um, is uh, uniquely identified by a URI, which, which stands for Universal Resource Identifier. And there, all the resources in this graph are interconnected by hyperlinks. Okay, so this is, the, this is the basic model of the resources in the linked data. And um, there is a so-called five stars principles, uh, principle in order to, um, in order to uh, understand if the data you're publishing to the web is a linked data. You got a one star if the data is available on the web in whatever format. You may have two stars if the data are available on the web, but in a machine readable and structured format. You got three stars if the data are, is available in a no proprietary format. Four stars if the data is published and uh, using open data standards. And finally, you are the best one, so you have five stars if all the above uh, uh, stars apply plus links to other data in the same formats. Okay, some very uh, brief, uh, ex simple examples. Uh, the, the, the like button on Facebook actually embeds under the hood a, um, some, some uh, linked data, some semantic web data in a, in a format which is called RDFA. We, we'll talk about that uh, briefly in the next slides. Or for instance, a very famous project, which is called DBpedia, which is a, uh, a sort of transformation of the textual data coming from, text, from Wikipedia in a linked data format, okay? Uh, just to, to, to make an example how this kind of stuff I really used in practice, uh, if you consider the Wikipedia page about the Python, in this case is the animal, um, this page has been uh, transformed in the DBpedia standard, okay, the DBpedia um, storage. So the format of this page is structured in some uh, in some way. I will not go uh, into the details. So this link will correspond to this one on the on DBpedia, okay, and then the DBpedia here contains some semantical information about the content of this page. And the BBC Nature section actually exploits this kind of information in order to uh, categorize the pages about animals in this, in this uh, website. In this case, the, the Python is under the reptile, actually this is almost unreadable, sorry for this, but here it is reptile and the BBC Nature's website exploits the DBpedia stuff to know that the Python, a Python is a reptile, okay? And this corresponds actually to this kind of, uh, this is called a schema, uh, a semantic schema, where uh, you have a set of different terms you may uh, look on, and in this case, the class of this animal corresponds to the reptile, okay? This is just a very, very simple example. Uh, linked data in the web. Actually, in, the, in 2007, this is almost this was almost the situation of the linked data. In 2008, this is the graph, the, the snapshot of the linked data available on the web. This is in 2009, and this is a snapshot of the linked data in 2011. Okay, so every day new formats come and new linked data come in the repository. This is actually the main idea of the linked data. A very huge graph of resources interconnected each other, okay? So here we go to the semantic part. Uh, the semantic web is um, uh, very famous, I guess, um, is based on some principles. Uh, this, according to Tim Berners-Lee, who is the creator of the World Wide Web and one of the first um, uh, uh, supporter for this kind of techniques, uh, the semantic web is a system that enables a machine to understand and respond to complex uh, human requests based on their meaning. That's why the semantic part. And uh, from a practical point of view, the semantic web is built upon a set of standards and best practices. Uh, 
the so-called standard stack is composed by under the hood by the URI, which is the, the structure, uh, the, the um, basis on which every single resource can be uh, uniquely identified. On top of it, there is the RDF, and then the others, um, the other levels, the, the other layers of this stack up to the, 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 the proof and the trust one, okay? Indeed, the, 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 these are some details. Uh, the URI and the Unicode are on, in the basis of this stack. And then uh, we have the XML syntax in general, the RDF, which is uh, the, the, the resource description framework we are going to talk about in details in the next slide. And then all the things that are um, that exploits this kind of data model for uh, semantic data representation. And this is the final aim. So to have a sort of machine um, transactions, machine um, uh, interactions, uh, you exploiting this kind of data. So an algorithm with this kind of data should be able to uh, automatically understand the meaning and so making some decision about it. Okay. The, RDF stands for Resource Description Framework. Actually, it is not a data format. RDF is a data model to express relationships between uh, arbitrary data, data element. RDF files can be serialized in multiple formats, uh, Turtle, on 3 or RDF XML. And these files can be stored in, this uh, serialized version of the RDF can be stored in files or databases, also known as triple stores. The, the name comes by the, the model of the data, so in the RDF. Uh, the RDF data model is basically a graph-based model, okay? So we have a set of triples where we have a subject, a predicate, and an object, and we end up with all the data represented with a set of different triples. Uh, in general, all the, tri all the elements in the triples are referred as, as resources, okay? So we uh, talk about resources when we deal with our RDF data, and all the resources are identified by unique URI references uh, that are usually uh, referred as URI refs. The, the main difference be, between uh, UR, URI and URLs is that the URLs are the, just a way to link and to reference some data, uh, sorry, to, to link to some data. The URI is uh, instead a way to uniquely identify a single resource on the web. The, the RDF model also allows for blank nodes in the case, so also known as anonymous nodes, anonymous nodes, in case you don't know the URI of the thing you would to reference. That may it may happen actually. So we end up with this kind of graph. For instance, we have a blank node here with this different set of uh, attributes and links. So we have, in this case, a blank node that has uh, first name John, second name Doe, weblog, this weblog, and then this blank node knows this other guy here, which is another blank node that uh, it has Steve and Taylor as first name as email, this Steve Tay at mail.com. Okay, it's just a very, example, very simple one. And finally, the data model also allows for a literally, literal values. Some examples are these ones. And they, the literal values may also and may optionally have uh, the language reference or the type reference. For instance, if you're, um, you're uh, talking about a weblog or a Wikipedia page, you may have the same page in different languages. And that's uh, uh, the case when the language attribute comes in, into play. Uh, very few words about the serialization formats. RDF allows for very different serialization formats. They are very useful for the uh, reuse of the data. Uh, they are the N triples, the N3, RDF, XML, RDFA, and the RDF JSON, just to mention the very famous, famous ones. Uh, the first one, the N triples, is the very simple format, and it's very readable for human readable. Uh, N3 is Simple as well, but it's more compact. 
Uh, RDF is a classical representation of this kind of data, and it is the original W3C recommendation about this. RDF is a compact way to represent RDF data and is very integrable to other formats, such as X HTML pages. And finally, the RDF uh, JSON format, which is useful in case of RESTful APIs. So like, uh, let's make some examples. In this case, we, uh, I uh, get the DBP the page, the DBP the representation of the Python programmer language page on Wikipedia, okay? Wikipedia shows you a set of structured information about the Python programming language. In this case, we have DBpedia OWL, which is the prefix for, uh, it's just a prefix. Uh, designer, that is Guido Van Rossum. Developer, Python Software Foundation. Influenced, Boo Programming Language, Cobra Programming Language, D, F Sharp, and so forth, okay? The main, the most important thing here is that every single value in the, um, in this page is actually a reference to any, to other resources, okay? This is what I meant when I talked to, uh, when I talked about linked data, okay? So, the, these data in n triples format is, it, sorry, okay. Uh, this data in the n triples format is just like this. It's, n triples is the simple representation and the most human readable. We have uh, the subject, the object, the, pre, the predicate here, the property, and the, the object, and we end up with all the different uh, triples in our data set. We usually have some prefixes just to, to allow for references to the meaning of the different, um, of the different uh, reference. Uh, and that's it, so it's very simple. Every triple ends with a, with a full stop, so it's, that's it. The N3 representation is a more compact representation. It basically avoids the rep repetitions, the duplications. It's just exactly the same. Apart from that, every, every repetition is avoided and is uh, substituted by a, a comma. So we may a list of elements that having the same prefix or the same property. And finally, the RDF XML representation is an XML representation of the data, so we, we may structure the data as an XML resource, and then we have a more verbose and a more uh, um, uh, structured representation, most, um, uh, in, mostly intended for algorithms and for processing, not for reading, okay? For human reading, I mean. And finally, the last important things to say is that RDF comes with different vocabularies. The vocabulary for an RDF is a definite set of predicates. So when you want to know how are, uh, uh, which are the, the, the predicates you, you're going to use for to describe your resources, the vocabulary is the, the things you're going to use because uh, the vocabulary defines the set of properties you may use to link the subjects and the objects in your data. There are many different vocabularies. Some of them are the SEOC, so that stands for Semantically Interlinked Online Communities. So this is a vocabulary for online communities. The fourth uh, vocabulary, which stands for Friend of a Friend vocabulary, actually this schema, uh, this vocabulary um, is by Facebook, okay? And this course vocabulary that stands for simple knowledge organization schema. These are just two um, very few uh, vocabulary. There are many of them. Actually, in the linked data world, there are very, there, there is a huge set of these vocabularies, uh, differentiated by the, the intended use and the domain they refers to. Okay. Uh, in particular, uh, shock, fourth, and scores are interconnected. So this is, uh, a very uh, brilliant example of uh, interconnected data and linked data. In fact, we have a fourth person here that it corresponds to a user in the SHOC, in the SEOC um, schema. And for instance, the, the user 
creates some blog posts that are related to the concepts, and these concepts have been described in a SCOS schema. Okay, this is just a very simple example of interconnected data, interconnected data formats. Okay, we will uh, dive in the, into these examples in the few slides with Python code. So, um, how do we query the data represented in RDF? We use a language which is called SparkQL that stands for Simple Protocol and RDF Query Language. And it's the standard query language for RDF graphs. SparkQL attempts to match patterns in the graph, so it is a patterns-based uh, query language, and it binds wildcard variables to find a solution. Just to make some examples, in the formal example, we select all the predicate and the objects coming from the DBpedia resources referring to the Python, uh, Python programming language. In the second example, we want to get the abstract of the Python coming from DBpedia that filters only the language which is English in this case. And finally, in the last examples, we, in the last example, we want to get all the list we, we call the union here. I don't know if you can read this. We call the union uh, operator in the SparkQL language, and we get the list of all the, the languages that Python influenced and all the languages that Python has been influenced by. Okay, we get all this data on a list. It's very simple to SQL language, okay? But the difference is that SparkQL is able to make queries on data represented in, our, in the RDF format. So we finally end up with the last part of the presentation, which is about the mastering linked data with Python. So I guess this should be the most funny uh, part of the, this talk. The, 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 the Python solution to, to tame the semantic web is mainly based on, RD, on the RDFlib. RDFlib is a great package, it's a very um, uh, great uh, library that keeps on improving and extend uh, its functionality. Uh, if you want to import it, uh, you, you write import RDFlib. Uh, RDFlib has a built-in object which is called graph. The graph is, or the, in this case, a conjunctive, uh, conjunctive graph, but it's a graph. And I will, uh, <laughs> there are only details about it. So we create a graph here, then we may parse a single resource in, represented in the n triples format. So in the parse method of the graphs allows an additional parameter that tells the RDFlib, which is the format of the RDFlib. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your point. Uh, maybe yes, yes. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, then we, so the parse method, get these, these, these RDF files in the uh, in memory, and then we, uh, and creates the, the RDF graph, and then we may iterate on the triples of this graph with, with a, in a single for instruction, then we may list all the triples that matches, for instance, the, um, this is a very simple query on the, the graph, we get all the triples that matches this sort of query, so we get all the resources that have the RDF uh, about properties, uh, no matter which is the subject or the object. Okay. We may also manipulate the graph, so we may add additional nodes and triples in particular to this, so we had two nodes and, and a link between them to, to the graph, and then we may finally store and save the, gra the, the resulting graph in a serialized format. In this case, we serialize the graph in a pretty XML version, okay? And that's it, very, very simple. RDF can be extended with persistence support. 
Uh, actually, th th there are many projects supporting the persistent. So there is RDF lib CQLite for CQLite persistent, PostgreSQL, AQL, ZoDB for uh, ZOOP databases, MySQL, RDF JSON parser and serializer, LibLDB and SparkQL store for general tribal stores, and RDF lib SQL Alchemy that allows you to deal with RDF data model in a more ORM oriented way. Uh, just to make an example about the RDF lib SQLite, here we uh, invoke the plugin model here, the plugin for SQL store. So we create this file, okay, and then we start to create a, a, a graph. So we add these two namespaces, these are the, the namespaces of DBpedia. Then we add two different triples to these graphs, and then we, we serialize the data and commit the serialized version of the data to the data store. So this graph has been saved in the rdf-test.ts, which is a SQLite database. And finally, we load the data in, in a few lines of Python. We, again, get the uh, plugin. This is supposed to run into different uh, uh, Python shells. So we get again the, the SQL plugin, we open the file, and then we create the graph and serialize the graph directly from the store. Okay? Very simple. One of the greatest features of RDF lib is that it, uh, it embeds SparkQL uh, functionality, so you may query your model, you may query your data directly using uh, SparkQL. There is a SparkQL uh, library in the plugins uh, model, and in particular, in this uh, particular example, we're going to use a prepared query, which is a sort of template query. So we prepare the, the SparkQL query here. In this case, we want we are interested in getting the object that uh, a general language has been influenced, has influenced. Okay, uh, and we initialize the namespace here telling to the query and to the uh, query engine that the dbpedia uh, prefix corresponds actually to this uh, URL, the URI. Uh, this is just a shortcut to make the syntax more readable, okay? It's not actually needed, it's just a shortcut to make, uh, to allow for a very simple query, uh, both in, the, in writing and reading mode. So finally, we get the graphs. So we get the, the, from DBpedia the graph corresponding to all the programming language. And then we query for the, the set of languages that Python, in this case, because language here, the init binding parameter allows to substitute the variable language that is the one, the one guy here with Python. And Python is the object corresponding is this one is the object corresponding to this URI. Okay, so we're referring precisely the Python programming language into the DBpedia storage, and then we substitute the, the, the variable language to, to the Python. So we are looking to the, the set of languages that Python influenced. Okay, so far so good. Is that okay? Okay. So let's see. The RDF lib in action, and in particular, we're going to um, to see an example that exploits the social, social network analysis. I'm sorry, and in particular, the semantic social web network analysis. We are going to to work with these three um, RDF vocabularies. In particular, these is these are the data we are going to use. Uh, as for the the fourth schema, so the friend of a friend schema, the friend of a friend schema is used to represent the social network, okay? The friend of a friend schema uh, contains the fourth nose, which is the relation that you may use to interlink to different person, to different people, uh, to people in, the, in your network. So you have here the node corresponding to Tim Berners-Lee. This is the, the unique reference to this guy. This, guy, this node here has a fourth name corresponding to Tim Berners-Lee. That is uh, this one here, okay? Then we know that Tim Berners-Lee, 
the guy here, knows with the fourth nose relation, knows other guys, for instance, the John Markov, and we reference the node of the person know uh, by uh, Tim Berners-Lee by uh, his uh, unique reference, okay? And this is a, a graphical representation for the uh, this uh, RDF uh, in the XML version. Then we have the SCOS data. The SCOS data are used to represent a taxonomy of different concepts. So we have a set of concepts, and in particular, we exploit the two properties of the SCOS model, which are the SCOS narrower and the SCOS broader. In this case, we are able to specify uh, which is the relation among different topics. Okay, so in this case, we have a knowledge representation and the knowledge representation corresponds to artificial intelligence, that is a broader concept of artificial intelligence, and it is narrower with respect to the description logic. This is just an example. Okay, so in this case, we are able to set a taxonomy of different concepts, and we want to exploit this structure. Combining all the information in the final SIOC model, okay, so the semantically interconnected online community vocabulary, we have here a blog post. The blog post has a title, for instance, that in this example is named title, but it's in this uh, file. And actually, it's the lower bips and stuff like that. Uh, every single blog post as, an, as a creator, thanks to the shock has creator property. The as creator property corresponds to a fourth person. And in this case, the creator should be, for instance, T. Berners-Lee, the guy in the previous slides. And every blog may have a set of different shock topics. And the shock topic associates to a blog a set of SCOS concepts. Okay? So this is an example we use to interconnect the different uh, data in the different data formats. So we want to apply social network analysis. We are interested in, for instance, know who are the most connected people, who are the most influential people, who, where are the clicks in the graphs? And we're going to use the Network X library, which is a powerful library in Python to, to, to make this kind of stuff. We start by loading and parsing the graph. Okay, so we create the graph here. And then we, uh, we pass the fourth graph and the SCOS graph in very few lines because RDF lib already uh, embeds the namespaces for the fourth and the SCOS vocabulary because they're very, very famous, very, um, they're mostly used by, in many cases. And so uh, we are not required to write um, a lot of code because we import the namespaces. So this guy here have, uh, already embeds the reference to the URL of the schema. And that's it. So we create two different graphs for the two formats. For the, as for the shock uh, RDF file, we need to write uh, some more code because this kind of schema is not uh, provided out of the box by the RDF lib. So we create the RDF um, names, we import the RDF namespace, we inject in the graph these two namespaces. This one is for the shock. This other one here is for another namespace used in the data, which is called Dublin Core. This Dublin Core schema is basically used for bibliographic information. So in case you uh, work with, I don't know, uh, documents and uh, stuff like that, usually this kind of data are represented by means of the Dublin Core. Um, and then we create the graph, we bind all the namespaces to these graphs, and then we pass the shock graph file part. Okay, very simple. So we uh, build the social graph here. So we, uh, after we have all the graphs, we merge the RDF graph, and then we query the graph with a SparkQL query. In this case, we want to get all the nicknames of the, the, and the, the, the couple, the, the, yes, the couples of users and nicknames corresponding to the fourth nick uh, attribute in the data. So fourth correspond to the fourth namespace and RDFs correspond to the RDFs, FS namespaces. And then we get the nicknames corresponding to the uh, ID and the nick here. We added this as a string then. 
Then we build a network X graph of relationships. So we import network X. We create, in this case, a graph, which is a network X graph. We um, query the model, getting all the, the users and the, so the subject and the objects of our data corresponding to the fourth nose relation. And we make an edge in this graph connecting node A to B because they, they know in our uh, RDF network represented. Um, so we have the network X graph. We may find the click with this graph because now an, an X graph is a network X graph. So we look for the different clickers and it's very simple because a network X already embed um, a method to this. A click, by the way, is all, is a, is a subgraph, subgraph where all the vertices of a, uh, are connected component. And we may also interested in calculating the centrality of every node. In this case, we're going to use the betweenness of centrality. The betweenness centrality is one of the metrics almost used, uh, and very famous, uh, usually used in social network analysis. Uh, betweenness centrality corresponds to the number of shortest paths from all the vertices to, um, to the others that pass through that node. So in this case, we, calculate the between us and try to do all the graph, and then we get the most connected uh, guy in the, our network by sorting by the uh, score here. So we, we see, sort the list of scores getting by uh, the between us and try to, and we get the results. Very simple. This is network X. The RDF uh, was just, uh, in the previous part, just to load the data uh, for the graph we are going to analyze. So that's it for Network X, but what about the RDF and why and how we may improve the analysis and exploit the fact that we are dealing with linked data and the RDF data? A very simple example should be this one. We may extend the network of friends um, thanks to the leveraging on the SparkQL flexibility in uh, um, traversing the relations in the graph. In particular, the most important part here in this query is this one, because in this query we are going to uh, look for the common friends of these two guys here, Tim Berners-Lee and John Cage. With this query, we are able to get all the common friends, but the most important part here is this one, because as SparkQL allows to set this operator with this pr pr uh, property, which is the, the, the plus sign here, that tells the uh, SparkQL engine to traverse the relation recursively. Okay, so out of the box, this means that the, the fourth nose relations among these two guys is recursively repeated. And so he, he starts here to traverse the connected components starting from those uh, those nodes. And a more very complicated example is this one that tries to exploit um, the interconnected data. In particular, if you can remember, we have a set of users in the network, we have a set of concepts, and we, had a, we have a set of blog posts that have been authored by users in our network, and every um, every blog post is associated to a, a concept. With this query, almost complicated, I guess, uh, we're trying to select a different, we're going to select authors here. Um, we'll, I try to, to make that simple. Um, the basic idea is we're, we're looking for, given a user, in this case the target user is Tim Lee, the target user is used uh, here, okay? So we we'll look for all the other users. So this is the filter, so it may be simple to, to, to start with this part. We're filtering all the users in the network that are not, that, 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 that does not correspond to the author we're looking for. And uh, the two guys don't um, already uh, know each other. So we look for authors that have been authored blog posts that uh, whose uh, set of topics is 
almost related to the set of topics uh, the target user already did. And this is the, 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 um, this, this part because um, we have the set of concepts of the, the so we have the target user, we have the, the set of post of the target user, and here we have the set of concepts associated to the, the, the blog post of the target user. And so we look for the set of related concepts to this, this set of topics, in particular the, the narrower and the broader topics, okay? And then we look for other blog posts authored by different users that, I, uh, that the target user doesn't know already. Uh, whose concepts correspond to a broader version or a narrow version of the target uh, topic. I really hope that I've been clear. If not, please ask. That's no problem. So the last slide. Uh, what's next? Actually, we miss. Oh, sorry. Actually, we miss some parts. So the, there is the uh, the 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 other uh, layers for the, the semantic web stack, in particular RDF lib embeds other libraries to deal with the, the rest of the semantic web parts. For instance, the OWLRL, which is a project that allows RDF lib to integrate, the RL stands for rule language, so allows to integrate rule language to make the inference on the OWL data. And finally, there is the Fushi reasoner, which is um, an engine that takes all the semantic data and is able to make reasoning. It's basically um, related to description logic and rule languages over there. And uses, um, Fushi is a reasoner that allows you to infer new information. So get the semantic web, get the semantic representation of your data and tries to derive new information uh, considering that kind of stuff. And finally, the Python tree support of the RDF lib keeps improving. That's a great uh, feature, I guess. Finally, some suggested readings. These two books are very uh, nice, very well written. This is about SpyQL in general. This is about Python for the semantic web. And uh, these two books are very useful especially for those of you who have uh, never worked with this kind of stuff. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks, Valerio. Oh, yeah, I see a couple of questions. I'm afraid it's me again. Uh, just one question. The queries that you present seem quite complex. Can you give any indication on how much does it scale to... Well, beyond yeah. Wikipedia? Yeah, actually, I have to, yeah, I try to, okay, this one, yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, the scalability problem is a very uh, nice topic, so thanks for asking. Uh, the, the, the data I used to um, test this query were very uh, small, so uh, all the processing were allowed to run in memory. Actually, in, in that case, I uh, didn't use any uh, persistent uh, plugin for the added flip. So all the processing have been run uh, in memory, directly in memory. But in the general case, this is the, the drawback of this kind of approach because uh, it's based on graph processing. So uh, usually uh, in real cases, those data are stored in a set of, in a data source, in database engines that are called tribal source. There is just one I can remember, which is called uh, Allegro, I guess, which is Python friendly. So you may use this kind of technique to, uh, this kind of system to store your data in RDF and so um, gives uh, so give to, to, to that system all the burden to make the, the processing and returning you the results. Um, just to follow up and the other plugins that you mentioned, so the um, um, SQL Alchemy, the um, LevelDB plugins, they don't really support the query language then. It's more just, let's say, programmatic access? Uh, actually, all the, the, the plugins refers to the SparkQL language. Okay. I don't, yeah. is, it, is that okay. what you're referring to? I think we're getting the things. This one. Mm -hmm. So do these support Sparkle or? 
Oh, this one is just to uh, allow RDF lib to link to some tribal source in general. Okay. It's very general purpose. This one, SQL Alchemy, tries to uh, improve the performance of the RDF lib SQL uh, SparkQL um, model uh, module because um, every time you make a query with the built-in uh, module, you hit the memory every time, every time. Okay. With this SQL Alchemy, there is there are some abstractions, so you may you may apply some memory improvements. So in order to um, reduce the amount of memory required to make the processing. And in the other cases, these are just, uh, this one is very useful. I never had the chance to, to test it, but I guess that it, I love PostgreSQL, so it's, uh, maybe it could be a good chance to, to integrate this kind of data in the, uh, in the, in that, uh, database system. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Yeah, well, I had a similar question. It was uh, also about how you do a query when you have a very big data set. Which does. But then maybe another question. Um, <clears throat> isn't there a way to uh, query this language in a more uh, Pythonic way? Because it's, it's funny, funny. Yeah, this SQL. is exactly what the goal of the SQL Alchemy project, because in, uh, in this case, you're basically writing SparkQL code in your Python code, just like as you uh, would do in case of general as, as, as SQL, okay? So for relational databases. The SQL Alchemy tries to uh, abstract some object-oriented, you know, some object-oriented way, all the stuff, and try to apply the, the query in, in that way, but okay. I never use it actually. And then another thing which I didn't understand maybe is how, so everyone can basically define their own language, like Facebook define their own predicates and then someone define their own and then is there a standard somehow to know what should be a predicate? Okay, um, actually the predicate depends on the schema. Okay, so every time you define a schema, you define a set of predicates. Every predicate correspond to a, uh, a data format that usually um, uh, becomes a recommendation after some revisions by the W3C uh, uh, consortium. So you create your schema, you define your set of properties and your, your set of allowed relations for your data, then you, and the best way you can do it is try to integrate other existing schema in order to uh, support the linked data um, world in general. Okay, thank you. Okay, in case there are no more questions, um, thanks again and everybody enjoy the lunch. <laughs>